Hi, everybody. Ross Porter with you. Today, I am thrilled to have an opportunity to chat with one of the greatest basketball players any of us ever saw. A man so respected that his silhouette is the logo for professional basketball. He played 14 years, all with the Los Angeles Lakers. 14-time All-Star, a man who scored over 25,000 points. It's good to see Jerry West again. Jerry, how are you? I'm fine, Ross. Nice to see you and uh, see you're still active and busy. Well, trying to do so. Uh, Jerry, it, it's, uh, it's been my, my situation over the years that I seem to like to interview uh, older people. And that's why you qualified today. <laughs> Because you are six months older than me. <laughs> so join the club. You're right there. Well, thank you. We're going to review Jerry's magnificent basketball career in a few minutes, folks. But I want to begin our conversation today focusing on his life off the court. You have always been very dedicated to supporting veterans in this country. And that all started with a personal tragedy in your family, didn't it? Yes, it did. I had a brother killed in Korea and um, when I was a real young man and, and uh, it was probably, oh, I guess the greatest shock of my life uh, to thank someone like him who was deeply religious and uh, was such a giver to other people in a small little community. He would do anything for anyone. And... Um, it was probably one of the most hurtful things um, that has ever affected me because he was the one in a large family, there was always someone in that family that you seemed to connect with and they seemed to understand you a little bit better than anyone else. And he encouraged me all the time in a lot of different ways. And uh, as I say, at that point in time, you know, we were raised in not very much, well, little or no money. And uh, it was tough to grow up like that. And uh, to lose someone like him, who uh, was just one of those unique people we don't see very often. And for someone my age, I did not understand it. That, um, you know, they, everyone in this world has some beliefs in life, but he was deeply, he had a deep uh, belief in religion. Mm. And um, even to the day he died, um, uh, as I say, he practiced that in Korea, um, and he just was one of those unique people that happened to, that I was fortunate enough to have in my life for a short period of time. You were 13 years old at the time. I have seen you at golf tournaments uh, where veterans are honored. Uh, have there been other events that you gave time to? Well, there's a lot of events, uh, Roy, that, uh, you know, I, I've never really been a person to talk about philanthropic things and, and people who, who I admire who have um, been able to give a lot of money and change a lot of lives and also hopefully the direction of this country and the people who are our citizens. And I know there's a lot of different uh, events that I have gone to and have really never talked about them very much. But as I mentioned, uh, the one that I felt really uh, special about was my three years at the Northern Trust Open here in Los Angeles because they really um, uh, embraced charity. And uh, one of the things that I thought was really important because so many, so many other golf tournaments had it in their venues, they had uh, for veterans to come there free, uh, have food, enjoy the golf, and um, it was it was really pretty touching because you know you see a lot of people there that served our country for a long time, and a lot of them are not particularly uh, uh, healthy uh, because of the war. And I would go home at night, and I said, "My goodness, uh, some of the things I've done in my life uh, were." have really involved the state of West Virginia and particularly educational things that, uh, that I've really been involved in West Virginia and that actually the bulk of my giving has been to West Virginia University. And uh, there's part of a learning center in West Virginia, it's called the David West Learning Center. And it was kind of my tribute to him and uh, 
has like 60 computers in there. They have people to help students. And um, that's a very, um, for me, that's really, really important to me because when I was going to school, when you're so busy with practice, and as I say, I wasn't one of those students who was particularly a student who paid enough attention, to be honest with you. Um, I really didn't know how to be a student, frankly. And um, it was, that's been a thing that I'm very proud of, and particularly the kids that get an opportunity to go there and have tutors there will help them with their work that they're, they're struggling with. In 2019, you were presented the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the nation's highest civilian honor. That must have been quite a day for you. Well, Ross, you know, I think uh, for me, because uh, I think when you when you grow up in uh, meager circumstances, sometimes uh, your self worth is not what it should be, and a lot of, a lot of people struggle with that. And uh, uh, insecurity issues that um, that when you don't see the kind of when you don't kind of see the kind of uh, um, love and affection in your family that you go to events like this and you see people who are so gifted in terms of their commitment to whatever uh, to whatever charity they feel great about and there's another thing in West Virginia last year uh, one of the former players there and played in the NFL football player obviously NFL um, called me and they're building a, they were building a cancer center uh, addition at the West Virginia University Hospital. And he wanted a commitment and uh, I was thrilled to do it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, I've been involved in a lot of charities. I was in Memphis for five years and um, it, it was just amazing how going to, um, <clears throat> going to St. Jude's Hospital down there the things you see there all are, are mind boggling in terms of how they make you feel. These young kids who are helplessly sick and every once in a while a miracle occurs. And I used to go there and I'd walk out of there and I wouldn't feel very good about myself to be honest with you. I've been blessed with relatively good health. And I got to the point Ross, where I couldn't go back anymore. Mm -hmm. I would go to events for them but I couldn't do it anymore. It's just so tragic to go in there and you ask what, where so-and-so was and he or she passed away. Um, it was, uh, doesn't feel good. No. And I think anyone who's been through those issues with children and or family members realize how tragic it is to watch let's say someone older, they've lived their lives, okay? They've lived their lives. And even to see them go through some of the pain and, and torment that they go through, but can you imagine someone three, four, five, seven, mm -hmm. going through these things and you go in there, see them, and they, um, you know, they just look at their eyes and you can just see that they're sick. And um, that, that charity, it's amazing what they did. It's amazing. And when I was in Memphis, the Grizzlies actually built like a hotel where parents could come there and stay there. And it was a big push for the late Mike Heiss, who's one of the great owners we've ever had in this league. And the kids go there and the parents go there. They don't have to spend anything. And some of these parents don't have much. And to see them and talk to them, uh, uh, they're thrilled that someone pays attention to them, much less they're very sick children. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a lot of things that uh, in my life that uh, I wish I had been one of those players that played years ago. Uh, you're the proud moment. Made this monopoly you. money to play. Another yeah, proud and that You could do more. And uh, but as I say, uh, it's just some of these charities are amazing what they do for people who have diseases that that are life-threatening and or you're not going to recover. Uh, but you see it in all ages. Um, you know, now we have this COVID stuff going on and, you know, I, I watch this and I, I, it really concerns me a lot because I know a lot of people don't want to get vaccinated. And even if you get vaccinated, uh, I know a number of people who have, uh, who, who have contacted the variant uh, themselves. 
but it's just a precursor to a, a disaster to go get yourself inoculated. And so hopefully it will help you. And more importantly, I've always wondered, young kids who are not, um, not vaccinated and go home and give it to their parents, their parents die. I wonder what they feel like. Yeah. Um, it would be a tragedy. And that's happened a lot. Mm. It's happened a lot. And no one ever talks about that. But, um, you know, I respect people's choice. And, um, but I would hope that during this crazy time that people would look, and this is a, a, a big preventative uh, part of uh, bypassing COVID. Jerry, I was about to say another proud moment for you had to come in 1960 when you represented the United States by playing on the Olympic basketball team in Rome. You were co-captain of that squad. And I'll bet at that moment and those days that you were there, it really hit you what it was to be an American. Well, you know, well, there was everything going on at that time. You know, the Cold War, the threat of nuclear war, um, um, uh, my goodness, uh, racism was at its worst at that point in time. And uh, to be there and also to represent the United States as an amateur, Ross, I wasn't a professional. Yeah. And to win the, the gold medal, um, the whole time that uh, Oscar and I, we were the co-captains, we received the gold medal for our team. And the whole time up there, I wish that everyone knew what it felt like and what my thought process was. Yeah. You know, here, here I was a kid from West Virginia and didn't grow up with anything, had a skill. And my skill allowed me to be able to, uh, to be able to uh, do things that, and be involved in things that I never dreamed of when I was a kid, just because I had a skill. I got an education. I've met people through my life I never dreamed I would meet. I've been all over the world at places and met very important people. And this was the most significant, I think, achievement that I've ever been, been involved with. And Oscar, who uh, I just, I've always loved as a player and more importantly, as a person, uh, for him to share it with him that night. But my memories of that, that setting up there was of my brother, David. He would have been, he never saw me play, never saw me play in high school, never saw me play in college. And that's the one time in my life where I really thought a lot, of, lot more about him and uh, one of the most touching moments ever. But I said this a lot and I'll say it again. I wish everyone who felt as nationalistic as I felt at that point in time could have felt the, the, the amazing energy that was going through my body. It was, mm -hmm. I will never forget that. Forget anything that happened in my NBA career. Forget it. That was the greatest moment of my life for two reasons. Mm -hmm. That we won and I felt like it was my brother. Wow. Well, Team USA played eight games. Uh, you won them all over a 15-day period between 24 and 62 points. And you came home with the gold medal. And uh, I guess the Soviet Union played you the closest, but uh, you had a very powerful team. You had Oscar Robertson, you had Jerry Lucas, and, and others I'm missing, but uh, that was something the way they did it. Well, it was a great team. And uh, at that point in time, Ross, no one, uh, no amateur team that was comprised of college players had ever won the tournament. It was just a bunch of amateur teams. There was a lot of them, and a lot of really good ones too, where kids did not want to play professional basketball who would have been drafted very high in the draft. They wanted to have a career when their, their days were over. And frankly, many of them made more money than the professional players. <laughs> but um, we would have had more American players on there if it hadn't been for that. But as I say, it's a thrill of a lifetime. My greatest thrill as a, a sports person was that. Wow. Jerry, you were born in Shield Van, Shield Yan, West Virginia. Your home was on Cabin Creek. <laughs> and when you came to the Lakers, somebody, probably the best basketball announcer of all time, Chick Hearn, began referring to you as Zeke from Cabin Creek. Was that Chick's idea? Well, actually, Elgin Baylor started, the late Elgin Baylor, who I loved to death. And uh, 
and um, shared a lot of great moments, a lot of very sad moments. And honestly, after a while, um, I kind of got to the point where it bothered me. Um, you know, a lot of fun is made of people from West Virginia and, and particularly growing up in this little area of about 500 people, uh, uh, there wasn't much there. And um, as I say, I love the people in West Virginia. I still have uh, some friends back there who obviously are old. And um, it just, that state was very important for me. And I, I learned a lot of lessons while I was growing up, a lot of lessons and how discipline and um, caring uh, meant. You care about what you love. And, and I think everyone in life should have an imagination. Some people don't. Some people say, well, this is what I wanna do. But you have to imagine. You have to have an imagination. I don't care what you're doing in your life. You have to imagine yourself at the lowest and also at the highest. And I used to play all these mental games with myself when I was a kid. And um, it served me well because I got to the point instead of missing baskets, I would always make the last one to win games. I was a coach. I was a referee, particularly a referee. <laughs> and I was the announcer. I'm sure that anyone who saw me out there, if they could see my mouth going like this. And Ross, I hardly talked to anyone. I was so quiet and shy. And I've always met myself make the last basket. I don't care if I've missed it three times. <laughs> the referee would find a way to put a second back on the shot clock and I would always make the last basket. So I would go home into a house that wasn't filled with much love. Mm -hmm. And that was my, that was my, that was my, well, my way of making me, uh, making me feel important. Mm -hmm. And little did I know that, um, you know, my life was blessed. I made a lot of last, a lot of last second shots and I really attribute that to my those young days, really young days when I was little, uh, to uh, to what mentally I practiced, and uh, never told anyone about those things. But um, uh, I find a way. I used to close my eyes and I'd go thousand one, thousand two, thousand three, and now you have that shot clock. A lot of players don't even look at the shot clock today. They don't. Yeah. I knew yeah. from talking to myself all the time. I knew it by heart. And now we have the fraction of a second up there. So a second could mean maybe five set, uh, five tenths of a second. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's how I used to make myself feel good and, and, you know, try to go home and feel good about myself. You may not remember this, but I told you once that my dad grew up in West Virginia, Mount yeah. Hope, Mount Hope. Now that's a bigger city than, than your hometown. I mean, after all, Mount Hope has about 1,300 residents. Awesome. <laughs> and your town had about, about 500, as you say. Well, it wasn't, listen, it wasn't a city where I lived in, okay? Where it you? was a little burg that I call it. And, <laughs> uh, you know, a bunch of people there, hardworking people. There, anyone could get a job then because there's so many different uh, uh, facilities for work there that uh, all were. A lot of them are related to coal mines, but um, yes, you're right. Uh, a lot of little small places. And I know where Mount Hope, if I'm not mistaken, we might have played them when I was a uh, when I was a freshman. I mean, a sophomore in high school. Uh, yeah. Played on the uh, played on the junior varsity team. Wow. Well, there's one man from Mount Hope that you know, Earl Jones. Yes. Earl was a seven footer whom you drafted with your number one draft pick in 1984. Mm -hmm. Got to tell you, not one of your better decisions, Jerry. Earl Jones played it was the worst decision. Earl Jones played two <laughs> games for the Lakers. He was on the court for a total of seven minutes. He took one shot and missed it. <laughs> you know what's really interesting, Ross? Uh, there's a lot of talented players. He was very talented, okay? He did not like to play basketball. And as soon as we brought him here, I said, oh my God. And I drafted him, okay? I said, this is the worst mistake I've ever made in my life. <laughs> it didn't take, he wasn't here very long, I must tell you that. No, you I traded him, didn't you? Hard work is a skill, Ross. And, you know, today when you, people look at athletes today, some of them are incredibly uh, blessed physically. Uh, they're, you know, they're amazing athletes and they're getting better, by the way because yeah. of all the training they do when they're kids. 
Wow. And her skill level is very high. But the thing that separates the men from the boys, actually, Ross, are, is a work ethic and desire to get better and to excel. If you don't have that, I don't care how talented you are, you're not going to make it. And Earl had zero uh, desire to, to be anything other than uh, someone who just wanted to have a good time and be around. That, that was it with him. And as I say, I learned a huge lesson. Uh, from watching someone who was very talented. And there were warning signs there, Ross. I mean, there were really warning signs. And sometimes you disregard it uh, because of the talent there and disregarded it and was the worst mistake ever. Jerry, how did you get your first basketball goal to set it up and be able to shoot? <laughs> Ross, oh my gosh. I wish I had old pictures of some of the things I used to do. Um, when I was a kid, um, I, you know, obviously there wasn't a whole lot of information about like we have today, uh, you know, none of the, none of the professional teams, you'd have to know a day later and pro professional basketball at that time was nothing, absolutely nothing. It was like in its real infancy. And, uh, but anyway, for some reason, there are three things I loved to do when I was a kid, fishing hunting and playing basketball. And they have whole one thing in common. One thing, you don't need anyone else to participate. None, not one person. And I say, I was very solitary and I, you know, I'd see hoops. I would take anything that was round and put it up outside, tack it onto some telephone pole or something. And, you know, a ball, you need a ball and a, something to go through. And, um, uh, some of the things I shot at weren't exactly like what the kids are shooting at today. And uh, uh, the other thing was sometimes if it was well, the terrain wasn't real smooth, um, if you didn't make it, and a lot of times when you make it, you can, well, if you're, if you're good at it, it can, it'll come back to you pretty much. Yeah. And um, I can remember shooting a ball and it either missed or it'll go through with the wrong direction. I have to check. So I, I would have to anticipate where this ball would go or otherwise it'd roll down a hill. <laughs> so I think from a, from a learning standpoint, that, that helped reacting. Everything was reacting. Now the other, the other two things are not rea reacting, but they're solitary. And um, those are the things I think it kept me, uh, uh, there was no way to get in trouble where I grew up. Absolutely no, nothing. But it kept me, my mind occupied. Um, again, I could be by myself and talk to myself, and, and uh, which I did a lot. <laughs> Knowing you, I'll bet you took so many shots every day that only darkness or your mom calling you to dinner <laughs> would make you quit. <laughs> well, as I say, you know, it, it's, in the summer, it's so hot and humid back there, even for me, but in the evenings, uh, I would do it. And again, there would be a, a call out, you know, get your fanny home, dinner's ready. <laughs> and then uh, in the fall, when even though it's brisk, it was a lot more fun then. And in the winter, it's hard to do it, but for some reason, I would, it would be snow out there and I could go and, shoot then and the ball wouldn't bounce as far away if you did it. But I actually remember shooting with gloves on and everything. It was crazy. It was crazy, but uh, it was just a thirst to become better and uh, to, to satisfy my mind that maybe I was gonna find something that would, I could do pretty well. You were, you were a natural. I was ever gonna be able to get a shot. Yeah, you were a natural shooter. Um, during your high school days, you accomplished a feat that is rarely seen. I mean, making the all-state team is the ultimate honor that a prep basketball player can achieve. Now, most youngsters who are selected as all-staters are chosen once their senior year. Friends, Jerry West made all-state as a ninth grader, a 10th grader, an 11th grader, and a 12th grader. Not only was he named West Virginia High School Player of the Year and earned a place on the National 
All-American team, but he averaged 32 points a game. Well, Ross, I'm not sure about the early years, but I know that when I was in high school, um, <clears throat> I was a fairly decorated player, had offers from everywhere uh, in the country, uh, Ivy League schools, even UCLA sent me a letter of interest. And I often wondered what, did I, what if I left to come to California, would, what would my life have been like? Um, I made the greatest decision in my life, all the offers I had and all the inducements that were offered. I went to West Virginia University and it's the smartest thing I, I've ever done in my life. And mm. uh, to this day, uh, the people have remained so gracious to me. And more importantly, um, because of my love for the state and the university, that's why I've chosen to have West Virginia University as a charity of my choice. And um, I have quietly not said a lot about it uh, because it's not something you should, I don't think advertise, but you know, I've looked over the years about charity and we talked about this early. And I remember when uh, America started to um, send a lot of money to Africa and you know, they found out that it wasn't being spent for what was intended to. And I often wondered if the presidents uh, or the people that were involved in politics, if they had gone there and, and this is what we're gonna do first. We're gonna build roads, we're gonna build infrastructure, we're gonna clean water, uh, sewage plants. We're gonna teach you how to garden with irrigation and everything. I wonder how much farther along some of these African countries are, would be. And it used to, as I got older and started to, and I read a lot of history, Ross, I read a lot, period. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually about, you know, our government, uh, uh, people who have been very successful a lot on, um, a lot of, on some of our great uh, black uh, historians and uh, people who have helped make a, make a difference in all, all everyone's life. And, um, it's just amazing to me how with a little bit of work, with a, bit, a little bit of foresight, this country could be far ahead and particularly in the area of uh, in integration and everyone's equal, Ross, everyone. And growing up, you know, I saw some things that um, probably forever um, affected my life, how people treated each other. You're supposed to treat people the way you want to be treated. Unfortunately, the color of someone's skin, and now it doesn't seem to be, it's all over the place. No one likes any, anyone. Yeah. I find that hard to believe yeah. because I just love people. I yeah. really do. Uh, there's some that are easier to be around. And you know, people ask me, do you hate anyone? No, I really don't hate people. I don't. Uh, there's people that have been less than candid in my life that have bothered me because I would never not do that to anyone and particularly to players. Um, I just, I knew how I felt like to not be treated fairly as a player. And uh, when I got involved as in the management end of it, a player was never gonna be underpaid if I was there, never. Um, I knew what was fair. And you know, if you sign one bad contract with someone, well, you have other players in your team that are better you have to make sure that you get rid of that guy and or pay them what they deserve. And today it's a little bit easier because the salary cap is going up and the, obviously the, the, the dollars have gotten so much bigger. Uh, but again, I just, life is about fairness. And in this world today, we do not have a lot of fairness. It seems like uh, I read uh, some quote today, I think uh, uh, some of our really, really wealthy, wealthy people, I'm talking about astronomically wealthy. If they spend a dollar, if they spend a million dollars, it's equivalent to one dollar. Yeah. And you think about that and you think, and many of them are very philanthropic. And I know that they, uh, a lot of them are involved in, in uh, health issues. A lot of them are involved in, you know, helping communities, which I believe in a lot. And I just see some of these areas that have been so run down for years, <clears throat> poverty stricken. And I wonder what if 
if somebody, two or three of these guys get together and say, hey, look, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take six blocks in this neighborhood. We're gonna give you all a new home. We're gonna give you all a brand new home. And to see if that would make a difference in people's lives. I'll guarantee you, if you give to someone who needs, where there's no ulterior motive, mm -hmm. do it for the betterment of those people, their children, and the community. Those are things that I would like to see a little bit more. You know, the, the, the um, contributions to these children's hospitals, love things like that. But at times, I wish we would concentrate in, on our country first. Jerry, you have said, the things that have always excited me are the challenges. I am really goal oriented. I've been that way all my life. For me, life is about passion. Very much so. Um, and you know, everyone, we make so much of athletes today. I would tell anyone who, um, who's young and, and say they're getting ready to, they're in high school, uh, make a list of things that you would like to achieve. Write them down, write them down. Don't keep them in your mind, write them down. Put them in your bathroom where you see them every morning. Hmm. And to me, it's a constant reminder, you can't change those things you wanna, you wanna achieve. Now, today in today's world, because it moves so quickly, you might have to adjust some of your goals, but you can't do that unless you, unless you know what you really want to do. Passion, life is about passion. Life is about passion. And anything you do, regardless of what you're doing, you try to do the best of your ability. I remember when I was a kid growing up that, you know, if I wanted to earn money, I had to do manual labor, okay, manual labor. <clears throat> and so if somebody had a ditch to dig, I'll guarantee you it was perfectly, it was perfect, okay? I wouldn't leave until it was perfect. I absolutely would not leave. And I particularly, people would want me to cut their grass because there was not anything that I would leave out there that a weed or whatever it was. And certainly we don't have the same kind of um, growing season nor um, the ability to pay for the lawns that we have here in Southern California in particular. And it always fascinated me how, I guess it's like, you look at something that's really ugly looking, say in a house, put a fresh coat of paint on it. I mean, it looks like it's brand new and it's the same thing to the outside of the house. And I was always driven by stuff like that. If I was going to catch a fish, if I was going fishing, I was going to stay there all day until I caught fish. And some days it was so hot, fish wouldn't bother. <laughs> and I would sit out there until I caught something. But more importantly, I always thought I was going to catch the biggest fish there was in the river. Uh -huh. And then I went to uh, trout fishing. And then I went to fishing in the ocean. And I still remember and recall sometimes that the late Baron Hilton and I were friends and he loved to fish and we'd go to Alaska and fish for salmon. And he was really a competitor. And um, two years in a row, I caught back to back, I caught two 55 pound King salmon, Ooh. okay? Wow. And, and everyone, and particularly him, he had to look at me like this and he didn't say very much, but he one of the greatest men I've ever been in my life. and. Uh, we would go out by ourselves sometime and fish. If we caught a big one, it didn't count for the other people on the boat. So I think the biggest fish on the trip, biggest king salmon on the trip, okay? So I won that about five times in my life with him. And uh, he was just, uh, it's nice to be around people who are competitive. And I think just being around certain people, you feel an energy. Uh, I think that, you know, most people who, look at basketball players or athletes are jumping all over the place. That's all well and good, but you watch the ones that are kind of quiet assassins, okay? Um, those are the ones I probably pay attention to more than maybe the ones that are much more boisterous, I think, because it's truly a passion. And uh, 
as I say, passion has kept me going through my life, Ross. It really has. Mm. Jerry, the word was that there were over 60 schools who expressed interest in you to give you a full ride basketball scholarship to their college. Was there ever any doubt in your mind that you were gonna stay close to home at Morgantown and attend the University of West Virginia? Interesting question. Uh, there were two schools uh, that in particular that I thought maybe it'd be kind of fun, okay? The University of Kansas, they had Bill Chamberlain at that time and their coach, <clears throat> I flew to, I'd never, I'd never been on an airplane before. Huh. And I was in high school and I've never been on an airplane. And they flew me to Fort Wayne, Indiana on a private plane. I go over there in this huge big office, a huge Kansas fan. And here's the coach sitting over there. I heard all these glamorous things they were going to do. And, you know, you and Will Chamberlain together. Well, heck, I never put myself in that category. I never even thought about it. I just, you know, I would just, I just wanted to play and see, see what I could do. And then the University of Kentucky had some interest to in me. And frankly, one of the Ivy League schools had a little bit of an interest to in me, but um, I knew what, you know, I sort of knew what I wanted to do. And I think the thing that decided for me, I went home one day on a, mm, I guess in like May, it's kind of warm. My mother sat down on the porch with three guys. And I'm saying, who in the world are these guys? Three college coaches, okay? And one of them said, I'll never forget it. And it was awkward because all of them had an interest in me. And my mother, I'll never forget, she was drinking a cup of coffee, one of her probably 10 a day. <laughs> and she said, well, I'll let you talk to Jerry. She said, I only wanted to go to West Virginia University. And I said to her, I said, oh my gosh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna talk to these guys? But uh, I think the thing that really decided it, honestly, I got tired of people, coaches wanting to talk to me. and. I called my best friend, he's still alive today, Willie Akers, and uh, I said, man, what do you want to do? I said, I can't take any more of this recruiting. I said, I said, I don't know how to deal with it because again, I was completely shy and uh, really honestly didn't know how to communicate with those people. So I, I said, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to call Fred Charles, who was a coach at West Virginia. I'm telling him I'm coming to school. And so he, did this very same thing. And we've been lifelong friends from college. Uh, we room together all the time. He's just an incredible person. And uh, I'm lucky that I had him in my life. So Fred Schaus didn't really have to recruit you with a presentation like he did a lot of kids. No, not really. I remember one time he came to see me and he asked me to walk out to his car with him. And uh, I walked out to his car and he he said, well, I've got something for you. And it was a West Virginia shirt. It was blue and gold, West Virginia. And he gave me a West Virginia, it says West Virginia basketball. And I was getting ready. I said, thank you. And I said, I really appreciate that. He said, wait a minute, I'll give you another. He gave me a gold one. <laughs> and I, for some reason, I, I sort of went back to the house. And I said, that's so weird that somebody would do, give me one. And act like he was doing a you know, big deal to give me another t-shirt at that point in time. So. Uh, I do remember that about recruiting, but um, I, I do remember what sort of changed this direction with so many people uh, wanting to recruit me. It was a state tournament where I set all kinds of scoring and rebounding records, and we won the state championship with not a, not a team that was good enough to win, but we won. And all the college coaches there watching that, and then uh, really the offers started to pour in, and then we, West Virginia played uh, Kentucky, all, uh, the Kentucky boys. And Kentucky had two players that were high, so highly rated that I even heard. And we played them in, uh, in, in West Virginia, which is right across, you can drive right across to Kentucky. We played them two games there, and I had two enormous games. I mean, enormous rebounding and scoring. It was crazy. And... Um, I was the most valuable player in that tournament. These other two guys, I said, my gosh, I said, mm, maybe basketball in West Virginia is better than Kentucky. But I'll never forget that after that, it was like the craziest time I've ever seen in my life. Coaches coming, um, it was like, as I say, I couldn't deal with this anymore. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, how, how can you hear the same question? All the promises. And I think the one at that point in time, uh, I won't mention his name. He was at uh, Texas A&M. And um, he said to me, he said, look, he was crying when he was doing this. And I was <laughs> laughing like crazy. He was crying. He said, um, he said, look, you've got to come here. He had coached Tom Gold in college. And he said, Tom Gola was the greatest player he'd ever seen. And he says, Tom Gola is not you, okay? He says, you're just simply better. And, you know, I'm, I don't like to hear things like that at that point in my life. And uh, he said, we're, we're, gonna give you a, 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 we're gonna give you a new car. I said, and then he said, we're gonna marry you to the rich girl, richest girl in Texas. And, <laughs> and, and we're gonna give you a clothing allowance. And, I had 40 inch sleeve link. Can you imagine trying to find something that would fit you? Then? Um, you know, we'll have your clothes made for you and uh, we'll fly you home as many times you want to fly home. So I said to him, I said, you know, uh, I won't mention the guy's name, but I said, you know, number one, I've never had a date in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, number two, we, we, have, we don't have a car in our family, so I've never driven a car. I mean, it was, it was pretty funny. It really was. But that's when I said, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I just, I decided to go to West Virginia. Um, smartest decision ever made in my life. Jerry, we had a picture up there moments ago of your high school basketball team. And uh, you're right in the middle of that photo. If we can show it again, Mike Kinner. Um, it was, um, it was very interesting because you had the basketball holding it and uh, there was some number on the basketball, I think, or something. You, you probably, you, that had to be uh, just terrific to have friends like that who played the sport that you love too. Oh yeah. Well, as I say, you know, the, our, our coach was, uh, he was head football coach and I could really, I was really fast and I could punt the ball and um, I wanted to go out for football. I weighed 152 pounds. I was six, three at that mm. time. And I grew another inch, okay? And he said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. So uh, he was smarter than I was, I guess. And uh, things turned out pretty cool when uh, we won the state championship um, in basketball, which at that point in time at the school meant nothing because they were a football power and also a baseball power. They, they would win the state championship in baseball every other year, it seemed. Mm. But um, those were great memories going up and some of the people that um, that was associated with along the way who um, that were just nice people. And, you know, they didn't treat me special. They, I was just Jerry. And that felt good and normal for me. Yeah. In your three seasons at the University of West Virginia, you averaged 25 points and 13 rebounds. The last year, your team reached the national championship game where you lost to California by one point, 71 to 70, although you scored 28 points in the final. You made history becoming the first man from a losing team to be voted the most outstanding player in the NCAA tournament. And I'll bet that still stands today, doesn't it? It's the only time it's ever happened. And, uh... You know, it, it was probably, um, honestly, Ross, it was probably the worst I'd ever felt in my life. Um, we felt we were good enough to win, and I got in foul trouble in the game. I didn't play a whole lot in the game. And it was so frustrating not to win that um, little did I know that this was going to be part of my legacy in life, that um, the same thing happened as a professional player. That's right. I was the most valuable player in, C in the NBA finals on right. losing to And uh, it feels horrible because all you want to do is win. For that time, at that point in time, when I was in college, the people of West Virginia, I really felt that I had let the people down in West Virginia. Hmm. And um, it's a horrible cross to bear. And more importantly, uh, when we get to, to the NBA, that I felt so sorry for our fans in Los Angeles that we couldn't win. Uh, getting there so many times and only winning once. And... Um, those are the memories I'll have, Ross. Uh, they were, and it's still, they left a lot of scars on me. 
Mm -hmm. And but probably I think the thing that it did, it, it, as I say, you have to you have to want to compete. And I was given a chance to compete in a different arena when I was a general manager of the Lakers and then president. And um, those were very formidable days for me and for the fans. Uh, Jerry Buss uh, gave me an opportunity when I'm not sure anyone else would have believed that uh, I could help. And um, it was just amazing to, to watch these incredible players that we were lucky enough to get together that turned into a team and a team that uh, it would really be hard for anyone in the NBA to beat that team today. Mm -hmm. the, first, the first Lakers. And um, then of course we had another era, uh, but it was, those were the fun years. Um, Jerry Buss was a great owner to work with and, and really a down to earth person. And, you know, you didn't go into his office and feel intimidated at all. Like, like when Jack Cook was there, he was, you know, you can't make, you can't make people win. Okay. You can't. The most competitive people play the most competitive games. The only thing you can do is go out there and compete as hard as you can, hopefully have a little good fortune. And Jerry made it possible uh, uh, to allow uh, to allow me to kind of influence him a little bit in certain decisions we made, and they turned out well. But um, I remember when uh, last time I saw Jerry was right before he passed away, and it was like, Oh my gosh, uh, so much to talk about, but so little time. And we really only spent a, a, a little time. He was, he was very tired. But uh, those are the great years of my life and the years that I'll never forget. And uh, even though I'm not involved with the Lakers and uh, at all, I still greatly respect what they've done there. And uh, I grew up as a Laker player. I grew up as a Laker executive. And it's pretty nice to stay there as long as one place, but inevitably it wasn't going to work. And uh, uh, even though I would have liked to have been there a lifetime, it's probably the best thing that ever happened to me to go to work for the Memphis Grizzlies. Mm. Um, it's probably the best thing that happened. It was like a, a working for an owner that uh, very much like Jerry, um, um, Mike Heisley, a uh, great guy. Um, all he said he wanted to win uh, was to do was to get in the playoffs. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, no, my, Mr. Heisey, I said, I'll guarantee we're going to get in the playoff. And he said, well, we've only won 23 games. Well, I said, I guarantee we're going to make the playoff. Our second year there, we won 50 games. Yeah. He was the happiest person in the world. Absolutely yeah. thrilled. And um, we lose in the playoff and he was miserable. And I said, Mr. Heisley, lesson learned. Okay. There's one step at a time, but we had playoff teams down there and, and we started to become uh, popular in the town. And uh, it, uh, it was a fun time for me to be away from the city of Los Angeles back to uh, maybe more of what I grew up in and where, you know, where uh, this person said this, this person, no, it wasn't like that. It wasn't, it, the, the writers there were more uh, friendly to the team in terms of, because Memphis didn't have a team and it's a very poor city and um, to go there. And again, my association with uh, St. Jude started there also. So uh, a lot of fond memories and some really great people I met there. Before we take a look at uh, Jerry's professional basketball highlights and uh, his executive successes, I want him to tell you about another sport that he loves. What's the other sport? It gives Mr. West a great deal of pleasure. Golf. Jerry, how has golf been a positive influence on your life? If you think about it, remember what I said earlier, there's three things you could do by yourself <clears throat> in your imagination. Golf is another one, four. Uh, all I did was hit golf balls and play golf. And I had gone from a, a someone who hit a big slice all the time and knew how to keep and play. And I always seemed to be able to make putts, but I was never, I was like a four handicap, but I was never someone that was going to really probably threaten par. And then I went away from, um, from Los Angeles for one week and took golf lessons from a, a player, a person that has been in his career is kind of very controversial. And uh, he named Jimmy Ballard and 
when I came back from there, Ross, I, I learned, I knew how to play golf. <laughs> and I shot, I think in 25 rounds that I played after that, there was one round I shot over par. One round. Oh, wow. Well, and, I was about to say, um, to tell the friends of ours this, this man was one of the most talented athletes from another sport to play golf. And you say your handicap was four at one time. Was that the lowest it got? Oh, no, no. I was a plus three. Oh, my gosh. Um, I shot I mean, four could, almost every day. You could have been a pro. No, I don't know that. I don't, I don't even like to think that because golf is something, you know, taking it up later in life, unless you, um, unless you are just, all you want to do is do that. It would be really difficult because golf is the most difficult game to go from a, like a player who can shoot par to under par, there's a big difference. And I could shoot under par, but I knew what my limitations were. And there are certain shots I didn't know how to hit and try to figure out how to do that. You need a lot of, I don't know coaching, but you need a lot of understanding and swing. It became very natural to me to swing at a golf ball. And now, um, I went out and hit some golf balls today. As a matter of fact, first time in three weeks, I come, I came back and I was shocked. I said, "Oh my God, this is pretty good." And mm -hmm. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play Wednesday. It's first time with some friends of mine, and uh, first time I went played in three months. And uh, but I hit balls first time today in ages. And I sat there. I said, "Oh my God, I'm not going to embarrass myself." But hitting golf balls and going to the course complete two completely different things. But it was fun for me to. Uh, go out there and solitary and, you know, you don't hear or see anyone around you. And again, hmm. solitary, solitary. And there's a bunch of sports, not a bunch of sports, but certainly you can't do that in baseball. You can't do it in football. Um, there's certain sports you can't do it in. You need other people to participate. Me sports, you don't. And those four things I enjoy doing in my life, I still like to do them. Hmm. I was told many years ago uh, by a friend of yours a story about one day you played golf at your club. And you can either confirm this is true or <laughs> deny that it happened. That particular day on the front nine, you played near perfect golf and you shot an incredible 28. 28. Nobody shoots 28. <laughs> well, Rose would love to shoot 28. On the back well, nine, the back nine, he shot well, a respectable 36 and wound up with a 64 for the day. Your friend said that you sat on a chair in front of your locker for a long time, unhappy or depressed. And the man who told me that story said it showed what a perfectionist Jerry West is. And Jerry, in some ways, I think that word describes me. You're always working and thinking about what can I do without a mistake? Well, Ross, uh, I would tell you, it was just the opposite. I shot 28 on the backside, which oh. is by far the hardest side. Oh, good, that's I better. I started on the backside. I made six birdies on the backside and I birdied number one. So I was seven under par. And number two, I could hit the ball a long way then. And those old Bolada balls, which would spin like crazy. Number two was, the pin was up front and I spun it into the bunker. It would look like it was gonna really be close. Uh, looked like it was gonna be in the bunker and it got in a footprint. I had no chance to get it out. I, and I almost made par anyway. The next hole was par three. I made par there. And then we get to the fourth hole. I hit a ball out of the back. On four, and I made par with my next shot. I made par on a three part. The easiest hole in the course. People let us go through. I made double bogey there, and then I birdied seven, eight, and nine. I had ten birdies that day. Oh, and I was so depressed that I didn't hit balls out of bounds. Okay, I didn't. But that was probably the most fun day, and also the most sad day for me because I would have liked to have made 
10 birdies, okay, come in and shoot seven, I mean, 60. Yeah. But um, no, I, again, I, I saw a lot of scores, low scores in Bel Air. And the course, they renovated the course. I don't think the course is as hard as it, it used to be, uh, but it's a completely different kind of golf course. Plenty of ways to play the golf course today where you're not going to get in very much trouble. But um, that, was, that was one of the most crazy days I've ever spent. And the front side, I, I think I shot 29 on the front side one time too. So, uh, mm. but it was the par, the par, the two par five holes in the first hole were four parts for me. And um, it was just, um, it was really, I was really proud of myself because it takes a lot of dedication to do that. And I don't tell anyone that, but to get to an point in time where I spent so much time with it. Um, and I had a caddy that used to caddy for me and I probably hit him four or five times. We did, they, we, Bel Air had no driving range. And with up to a seven iron in my hand, I wasn't gonna be very far away from the target. And I finally told him, I said, you can't do this anymore. Just stand behind the target. And he started wearing, he started wearing a, he, he wore a helmet. <laughs> <laughs> and he also had a baseball glove. I said, no, 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 you can't do this. But um, <laughs> Those were the fun days. They really were. And um, it was really fun to be able to hit the ball like that. And now, you know, every, I can still, if I play and I'm 83, if I play in practice, I can still shoot in the 70. Wow. And, uh, uh, but again, I don't have the same desire at all. I, I like to work out and lift weights and stuff like that. And, but um, I don't have the same desire with golf that I used to. Have you ever made a hole in one? A few. A few. Yeah. How many? I, I, I tell you, I tell you one day when we used to start, it seemed like a lot of times we'd start on the back nine and then, and sometimes and I just rushed out there. I, I think I, I had to be somewhere and I rushed out there and I, uh, I hit my first tee shot at 10. It's long as a 210 yard shot. And I first hit my ball out of bounds. I said, don't I get a mulligan? They said, no, you don't get a mulligan. And I hold the second one for three. <laughs> uh, well, this is amazing that you tell that story. Yeah. Because my colleague of 28 years with the Dodgers, Ben Scully, belongs to the same country club yeah, as you do. And one day he went to the 10th hole, the par three, took his uh, left-handed swing. He is. All sailed out of bounds, two-stroke penalty. He teed up another ball, stroked it, and watched it as the ball rolled into the cup. Ho hum, just another par three. That's right. That's right. Well, there's a lot of ways to make, you know, you can do some crazy things. On the backside there one day, and we had a big bet. And um, um, and I was always giving strokes. And there's people I used to play with are not around now. And uh, I pull hooks a drive into the ditch, okay? Into the ditch. It's a, like a 567. The ditch was concrete line. It's not concrete line anymore. Uh, it's, a, it's a creek now. And so I go in there and it's laying up against something. I tried to hit a shot out and cross the fairway, kind of behind a tree. I was furious at myself because I was under part of that point in time. And so, so one, two, and Let's see, one, two, three. Um, so I said to the caddy, I said, how much, how far do I have? And he says, you got 210 yards. I said, give me a five iron. I hold it for oh. four. And these guys all, all gave a stroke to, they looked at me like crazy, but um, I've had some crazy, I've seen some crazy things. I actually made a hole in one. Uh, the last one I made was, um, at Riviera Country Club, yeah. for 16, 15, the three par, they, they were giving away uh, supposedly a watch, okay? And I wouldn't have kept it. I would have let them box it off for charity. Anyway, I had a nine iron and I looked at it and I said, hmm, that looks pretty good. And somebody says, that thing went in the hole. And I said, oh my God. So, <laughs> We get in, we get in, they said, no, the, uh, um, <laughs> and 
And they said, they know, you know what the prize is? And I said, no, two free tickets to a Laker game. I said, what? <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> so anyway, um, I said, I don't think I need those, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's the last one I made. But uh, playing golf is, again, it's uh, so challenging. And it's, it's one time when you're there by yourself, you can't, you can't hide you can't hide a mistake you make. And uh, I think that's why I love the game so much. Jerry Bean from West Virginia, you may have uh, heard of or even met my cousin, Ed Tutwiler. Oh, yes. He won 11 West Virginia amateur golf titles. He played on two Walker Tuck teams and he won five of his six matches. And we were always proud of what uh, we call it, uh, Tut Jr. Did you ever meet him? Well, they called him King Tut in West Virginia. Yes, I did. Uh, <clears throat> but he won the state amateur all the time. And uh, he was always such a gentleman and dignified. Um, he was a great guy, but he was a wonderful golfer. And uh, I think when you have um, uh, you have people from your home state that can play golf like that, you, you kind of rally around him, I think. And uh, he made a lot of people proud. And as I say, he was a real gentleman, great guy. Thank you. In 1964, he went to the finals of the National Amateur, and who did he have to meet but his longtime rival, Bill Campbell. And I think Tut lost two and one, but uh, that was something. Bill Campbell was a heck of a player, too. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, it's fun to watch, even today, watch a U.S. Amateur. These kids look like professionals today. They really do. Uh, watch how far they hit the ball. And obviously equipment has made a huge difference and the balls have made a huge difference. And, uh, but to watch these kids hit it like today, they're, they're actually pros because they know what they're doing. And uh, more importantly, they, uh, they get out there and it's not, you can see that they're very accomplished just watching them hit the ball. All right, folks. Now let's hear about the marvelous pro basketball career. One of the, uh, greatest men to play in the NBA. Jerry Elgin Baylor had already been with the Lakers when you joined the team after you were drafted number one in 1960. How long did it take you and Elgin to execute together successfully as you wanted to? Did you talk a lot? Well, I, I think both of us were very similar. Also. He was, you know, he is quiet and a fantastic man, okay, classy. Uh, he, he had everything you'd want in a man, but also as a teammate. Um, he took losses hard and uh, losing to me was like death. Um, and um, I think my second year after my first, after the, I started playing a lot after, uh, I think I started like the last 28 games of season where I would have played sparingly the other. And our, my college coach, Fred Schaus was my professional coach. And he, he would tell everyone, he said, well, I'm afraid he's gonna get hurt because everyone used to list me at six, two and a half. Well, so I'm six, four and a quarter, okay? Mm -hmm. I weighed 172 pounds, okay? but I could run and jump and shoot the ball. So uh, anyway, it was, uh, it's from here by the way. But uh, anyway, um, I think our second year, toward the end of the season, I had started to score a lot of points. And, you know, we had a team that wasn't perfect at all. It didn't fit great together, but, um, the, our coach just let us dominate games from an offensive perspective. And I think, I think my second year, I averaged over 30 from almost 18 my first year. And Elgin was, it was, it, it wasn't an everyday occurrence. He, he scored 30 all the time. And so we had, we, we won a lot of games, but it's hard to play that way. It really is because if you lose, what you feel like, what you feel like is every night if you lose, you feel like you've left the team down. I know I felt that way. Mm. And obviously you don't think about the contribution to winning, but um, as I say, I've always blamed myself for everything. I, I mm. don't, uh, it's just, it's me. I'd rather everyone else 
I'll take the blame. I, I'm not too proud to do that. And I'm not, I wasn't afraid of that. And I just would go and there's nights I would just go after games and drive around, uh, be so discouraged um, that we couldn't win. And I'm not sure fans really ever knew that, uh, but it meant that much to me to win because you know, everyone says, well, you know, you play for money. No, you don't. I didn't play for money. I played because I loved the competition. And more importantly for the fans, that's what meant a lot to me. And even today, you know, my uh, little role with the Clippers, you do everything for the fans. You really do. And I think that's one of the things I've always prided myself in regardless of where I've been or what I've been asked to do. You do things for the, you do things, if you're, if you're in the front office, you do things for players little things that maybe someone else wouldn't do every once in a while you write them a note and just tell them how much how much you appreciate what they've accomplished in their career and how well they've been playing um but for the fans you wish you could reach out to them and and let them inside of you know how much you really care about winning and um as i say there's a lot of a lot of really late night for me uh, where i couldn't sleep after the game Hmm. Um, nitpicking at my game. Uh, why didn't the ball bounce right this time? Um, but uh, I've always been that way, Ross, and it's not good. It's not good to be that way. It's just not. But uh, that's been me, and that's been my, I guess, um, my burden in life is I blame myself for everything and uh, can't stop it, to be honest with you. The duo of West and Baylor was among the most consistent and most explosive in the history of the National Basketball Association. Jerry, when I began to prepare for our chat today, I was very surprised with these numbers, and I'll bet you know them. Jerry West, 14 years with the Lakers. Elgin Baylor, 14 years with the Lakers. Jerry West averaged 27 points a game. Elgin Baylor averaged 27 points a game. Jerry West averaged 39 minutes a game. Elgin Baylor averaged 40 minutes a game. Jerry West scored 25,000 points and had 6,500 assists. Elgin Baylor scored 23,000 points and had 11,000 rebounds. Jerry West played in 932 NBA games. Elgin Baylor played in 846 games. He served some time in Army Reserve. Jerry West won one NBA championship in 1972. Elgin Baylor played nine games in 1972 before an injury ended his season, and he received a ring. Some members of the media still refer to Elgin as the greatest NBA player never to win a championship. Jerry West and Elgin Baylor were called Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. Jerry West for his outside shooting and Elgin Baylor for his low post ability. That really shocked me, Jerry. Did you know those totals? Well, you know something else, I, I never really paid anything to individual honors, but I know in my career as, as Elgin's, we both miss a lot of games and I miss in my prime loss. I missed, uh, I missed probably almost two full seasons with, wow. a, with a hamstring injury. And I often wondered if, you know, what, if I'd been healthy, um, maybe what kind of scoring numbers I would have had because we were asked to score and you just, it became easy um, because you know, your opponents, you know, you anticipate, if you have, if you've been a player that's done something at a high level, you've probably been given a, a other gift to see the game in slow motion. If it's going too fast, you're never going to be able to do those things. You're not going to be able to contribute. The players that see the game in slow motion, um, they just don't get as many trouble uh, turning the ball over, uh, getting themselves in predicaments where they, they, they can't get a good shot. And that's a, even though that's learned, uh, uh, with experience, uh, it's a gift. And you look at the players in the league today, oh my gosh, uh, how gifted they are physically, 
but also they're really, really great ones mentally. They're unbelievably gifted too. Talk about the Lakers record 33 game winning streak in 1972. Did you have many close calls? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I'll, I'll tell you, there's some really funny, some funny stuff that went on at that point in time. And what's ironic was that when Elgin retired, our record was five and four. Jimmy McMillan took his place. We won 33 straight games from that day. And I've often said, how did that happen without Elgin Baylor? I have no clue. I had no clue. But there was just something in the dynamic of the game change. Um, I think when you have three players in a team that are, you know, are offensive players, sometimes someone's going to have to sacrifice. And I do know that, uh, that Bill Sharman said to me that year, he said, look, I want you to lead the league in assists. I said, well, if I can, I will. <laughs> but um, I still average, I think, almost 27 points a, league, a game. And I, I, led the, I led the league in assists. And I was not nearly the player that I had been before because I'd had a knee injury that really, really put me on going this way. And today it would have been nothing. It would have been absolutely nothing. Uh, that injury would have been minor. Uh, but they casted you then and it was in a cast for three months and it just like your leg dies. But um, it was just amazing to do that. But we had games, oh my gosh, I'll never forget a game. There's a funny story attached to it. We played the night before in Chicago. We won a game there, but we had to take, we didn't fly private. We had to take the next available flight the next morning. And so we get to the airport every, I couldn't sleep. I probably slept maybe three and a half hours after a game, I couldn't sleep. And we get to the airport and they say the flight's gonna be delayed. Now remember, Philadelphia is one hour's time difference also, one hour. So we sat there on the plane and everyone was there and this kept going on and on. Now there's other planes that we should have caught to, uh, caught to Philadelphia, but no, it was, this is gonna be fine. Finally, I, I forget what time it was. They came in once again and said, no, I was, was still waiting. And Will Chamberlain said to one of the guys, he said, you know, if I had a gun, I think I would shoot somebody. And he was saying, <laughs> he was saying it jokingly, okay, jokingly. So we were all laughing because they took him off the plane. I said, you know, this will be a few minutes. All of a sudden he doesn't show up. The plane takes off without him. Oh my oh. gosh. So you start thinking, you say, oh my God, I can't believe this. I can't believe it. We go, by the time we got there, we go straight from no pregame meal, no sleep, no nap. We go from the, uh, from the airport to the arena and I couldn't eat very much for a game. I, I would get sick. So I think I had like a candy bar and a Coke, something sweet. And so Wilt still hadn't showed up and, it were, and everyone just so out of it. It was a joke. I mean, it was awful. He was just so tired. All of a sudden you look up and here comes Wilt, okay? It's about five after, 10 after seven, okay? 10 after seven, he gets it. And the first thing he did, he jumped on everyone. He said, I can't believe you didn't get off the plane and go with me and help me, right? <laughs> everyone was kind of snickering, right? And Will didn't take long to dress. And he had he never taped and everything. He was bitching the whole time this was going on. So we go out there in the first quarter. We're getting killed in the first quarter by about 17 points. And at that point in time, Bill Sharma was our coach. And you can't do this today because they would say it's an incentive for players and teams and uh, to make more money. Well, we had a system in place. You got $5 for every steal, $5 for every block shot, <clears throat> $5 for rebound, <clears throat> every rebound, and uh, $10 if there's a turnover, okay, if you made a turnover. So three ways that you could, okay? So all of a sudden in the second quarter, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden this Laker team, which had just ground everyone down, we start this comeback. Oh my gosh. 
at halftime, we're ahead at halftime. And the, th uh, the, the uh, third quarter starts and we are burying them, okay, really bad. So we get back to the bench and he did not take us out until, until about three minutes to go in the fourth quarter. We end up winning this game by 30 points, okay? Oh, my God. We looked like we had no chance. And after the game, everyone to see what the plus minus is what. Will had 16 block shots that night. So $5 times 16, had 31 <laughs> rebounds, okay? And about three assists. I had 10 steals. I had 14 assists. <laughs> and I had two block shots myself. <laughs> so that the game didn't mean anything. The guys were arguing with the guy that kept track with this. You forgot my five, you forgot my five dollars. So, well, Jerry deflected this ball and I got it. And it was like, oh my gosh. After and after the game, Wilt was like, he was like furious, okay, after the game because we had deserted in Chicago. But that's one of the most unique things that happened during that point in time. But uh, everywhere we went, it was like teams didn't have, see, I don't care who it was, really good teams. I mean, we would not win, but if people would have been, you know, the way they set betting lines today, if they would have bet a betting line, I think they would have won every game, 33 straight games. Wow. I mean, we just killed team, but yeah. that was a fun part of it. But the sad part of it is when we win the championship there, and the thing I thought about in the locker room, I thought a lot about Elvin in the locker room. You know, why, why did this happen? And why, when all the years that he was, you know, killing himself to help win a championship that we couldn't win one. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the sad part about it. And uh, anyway, it was one of the craziest stories that I think I've ever been involved in because someone you love as a player and someone who's great as him didn't get a chance to, he contributed some, but he wasn't there for the finish. And I did not, I did not like that. It yeah. wasn't. Good. Jerry, you scored 63 points one night in a game against the Knicks. Was that your high? That was my high. Well, and then the funny thing about that, I had a temperature like, you know, like 90, 99. I was, I felt horrible. And it's just one of those nights, but, Honestly, Ross, I probably had maybe 10 other times in my career that, that I could have scored in the 60s. Um, it just just wasn't meant to be because we were winning so big. And uh, But you got to the point that uh, the scoring part of it, again, was it was it was a learned experience, okay? Uh, you know, it's like a, a, a today we have all kind of films and all kind of instructions and telling you how to play someone. At that point in time, if you had to have your own mental catalog on who you're playing against, you know, what does he do well? What, what doesn't he do well? Uh, what does he try to do defensively? What does the team try to do defensively? And you sort of go through this, it's like a maze to be honest with you, but you figure it out before you go there because you've got this information that you have processed in your mind. And so it made it, it made it pretty easy to score some, type, some nights when you were when you needed to score, and particularly during the regular season, particularly during the regular season. You may have a 60-foot shot on a playoff game. Have you ever made one longer? Oh, no, but I made a, a number of loss uh, from half court, a number. But, you know, after practice, people, you know, today players practice at all time, and they're starting to shoot the ball deeper and deeper uh, in a league because of the three-point line. But uh, at that point in time, it, I used to probably after every practice take 10, 10 shots from at midcourt, but I made a number of long shots. And uh, that's not something that even, you know, wasn't even exciting then, but it would have, I wish the three point line had been in effect because we'd won the, we'd won the, we'd won the that championship in five games as it was, we lost it in seven. In 1965, you were in 11 playoff games. You averaged 41 points a game. And against Baltimore, you averaged 46 points a game. Unbelievable. Well, Ross, I think there's... 
I think, <laughs> hey, Gatsby, stop. Uh, I think at that point in time, uh, it was like um, Elgin got hurt. And the coach said to me in the first quarter, he said, of the game, it was in Los Angeles. And they had a really good team, the uh, Baltimore Bull at that time. They had a really good team. And so anyway, uh, he said, you've got to carry us through this. And it was, uh, it was the uh, conference finals. And uh, so it, I had one of those playoff series. I just, they really didn't have anyone to guard me, to be honest with you, or even bother you. And one of the best defensive players in the league was, um, was um, uh, what, Gus Johnson. And he was like six, seven and a half long. And he was one of the better defenders. They actually started putting him on me. But again, you know, they can't play up on you if you're quick enough. And, and uh, even though he's very physical and the game was much more physical then, um, I just, I don't know. It was just something that happened. And, uh, and uh, obviously very proud that we won. Uh, uh, we probably won, and uh, particularly with Elgin out, and to, to hear the injury he had, I, I knew it was going to be a tough recovery for him, and uh, and he came back next year, but I don't think he was ever really the same after that. I, I could see a difference in him, and um, it was sad. It was really sad, but everyone was thrilled because we won, and uh, that's why you play it for. You play to win. You don't, you know, if you can, if you're a little bit better than the average player, uh, because sometimes you can do some crazy things, and that was a pretty crazy playoff series. The Lakers were 0-4 in NBA Finals against the Boston Celtics. Jerry, our mutual friend, Tom Hawkins, always said the Celtics won because the Lakers didn't have anybody to match Bill Russell in the middle. But in checking, I found the Lakers lost by three points in the 1962 Finals, by two points in the 1966 finals and by two points in the 1969 finals. Well, as I say, we never had a bounce, to be honest with you. I can remember, I can remember a number of these playoff series, and not a number of them, two in particular, that I really thought we had the best team and we didn't win. And that's what that's what makes it so hard. Um, because you know, you pride yourself in what you do, regardless of what you're doing. You try like crazy to uh, to play to the level that you're accustomed to playing. And um, in the playoffs, I was, you know, I was like a, a different player in the playoffs. I was much more connected in terms uh, when during the playoff, a lot of times, whilst your average players sometimes, they don't play very well away from home. They don't. And it happens in all, I don't know if it happens in all sports, but there's something about the home crowd that brings more out than other people. And uh, and frankly, I, I used to rather play on the road. I, I felt I was much more motivated because it's harder on the road and uh, the other teams are very motivated themselves on the home court. But I just felt I was away from home. I, I like to play away from home. I don't know what, it was kind of crazy, but uh, there are a lot of nights coming to game in Los Angeles when you know, maybe somebody in the league who uh, was challenging you at your position, you really wanted to play that game and uh, to see who would win that contest. Uh, and it's it's a game within a game sometimes, but it's still, in first and foremost, it's a team game. Jerry, it's been four years this week since we lost Tommy Hawkins. Do you know that Hawk, who was six feet five inches, still holds the Notre Dame career rebounding record. He had 1,318 in three seasons. The last one 62 years ago. And Notre Dame has been playing basketball for 115 years. Well, Tommy, you know, Tommy was really a very quick jumper and a big jumper, obviously. And uh, I think the thing he did best was rebound. Ross, he had really tiny hands, and he it was hard for him to be an offensive player with tiny hands. And uh, so he changed coming in the league where he scored a lot of points in college. He changed into a rebounder, an aggressive defender. And uh, for someone his size, 
uh, he made a mark for himself and obviously is a great teammate. Uh, one of the nicest people you ever want to be around. That's right. That's right. I remember when he passed away, it was a shock to me because I thought he had been in good health and then yeah. suddenly he's gone. But just a great guy and um, uh, somebody you in, more than enjoyed playing with. He was one of those people that was um, serious about what he did. He was a real professional. He was with me at Channel 4 in L.A. He was with me with the Dodgers. We were very close friends. And uh, he thought very highly of you. Well, I think all of us then, uh, you, you were all real friendly. And the players were a little bit different then. You know, there wasn't very much money in the game at all, Ross. And um, at that point in time, everyone had to go to school for four years before you could play NBA basketball. And today, these kids that come in the league are so young. And they really, you know, they don't have a, they have, they don't have a lot of experience with, you know, with being around older people. And so their adjustment is harder, but because they have been publicized all their lives, there's an expectation level sometimes or beyond what they should be. And uh, for these young kids, I, uh, today, I just, you know, I wish them well. And, uh, and again, they have to understand that they have to set goals for themselves all the time to get to the point where they want to get. Uh, but uh, again, the players, we used to have conversations that, I wish you could have recorded them. We'd be talk a lot of times we'd be talking about race, uh, sitting in, there might be seven or eight people or 10 people in the room. We'd talk about race, about the conditions that we had to play under, um, uh, the threats all the time to the players from the owners and also from the NBA. Um, it wasn't until the All-Star game in 1964, Ross, that players finally had an opportunity uh, to have some voice. And if you look today, their voice is not only loud, but it's heard. And to some respects, they run the league today. Jerry West was inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame in 1980. He is known as one of the best team builders in NBA history. Some people say he was the best general manager that the NBA ever knew. He won eight championships as a player, executive, or special consultant. Twice he was voted executive of the year. And I'm going to run through this quickly, Jerry, but I want people to remember what influence you had. You were affiliated with the Lakers for seven titles, four as an executive, two as a special consultant, and one as a player in 1972. You were general manager of the Lakers from 1982 to 1994, then executive vice president of basketball operations between 1995 and 2000. The Lakers won championships in 1985, 1987, 1988, and 2000, and you were credited for building the dynasty in the 1980s. You took two years off. You replaced Bill Sharman as Laker coach. You won an NBA high 53 games in the first of 17 straight playoff seasons. You coached from 1976 to 1979. You then went to the Memphis Grizzlies from 2002 until 2007. They made the playoffs in three of those five years. Jerry West was a special consultant with the Golden State Warriors for six seasons beginning in 2012, and they won three NBA championships. He joined the Clippers in 2017, and I'll never forget a, one day about two years ago, I was driving home one day and Jerry, you were the guest of a couple of uh, sports talk show hosts in LA. And one of them started bragging about the Lakers. And you said, you know, the Clippers had a better record than the Lakers the last five seasons. <laughs> So also, you know, as I say, because the Lakers are, you know, no one's going to replace the Lakers in town. The Dodgers, even they're popular. They're not the Lakers. <clears throat> this is the most popular team in town. And, uh, you know, as I say, I'm proud of my association with them. But these franchises, they don't, they don't endure forever. And one of the things I will say about the Lakers that have happened, if you look at the players who have played for the Lakers as compared to the Celtics, there are more great players that have played for the Lakers 
really great players and have for the Celtics. Yeah. And um, it just tells you the enormous pleasure that fans have had to watch these iconic players. They, they got LeBron James there who is, you know, you look at him play and everyone talks about his age. Well, he's one of those players. I almost think he could play till he's 50 because he's so smart and he has a unique skill <clears throat> with his power, his, uh, his shooting has gotten so much better over his career, but his ability to lead and make decisions is absolutely remarkable. And if, if everyone could accept that he wasn't going to score 25 or 30 points a game, my goodness, you would see a player that maybe could play longer than any player at a very, very, very high level. Uh, but they've done some, that franchise has been amazing. And uh, to be part of that has been very special. A couple of quick questions for you. Who was the player that defended you better than anyone in the NBA? Boss, it's really, it's really hard to say, honestly. Um, honestly, when I was the height of my career, no one. No one. And I don't mean that in a braggadocious manner. No. No. Um, there are certain people that, um, and particularly when you're young, that uh, Casey Jones really, really bothered me early in my career. I, I was never a great dribbler. I got to where I want to, but not like these kids today. But he had Bill Russell behind him. If you go by him, it created another problem. And he would play right up under you. And uh, I just was not clever enough then to uh, be able to get by him and and also, if you did get by him, there was Russell there. How could he cope with that? It was a learning experience to play against him. But I felt he was a player that bothered me more early in my career than anyone. Hmm. Have you seen a better outside shooter than Stephen Curry? No. Absolutely not. I think we're going to see players that become much more uh, efficient in their shooting and from different ranges. Uh, he has obviously popularized the ability to shoot the ball. He has been one of those players that he just keeps getting better every year. And I will tell you, he's one of the truly, truly nice people ever. Mm. But we've got some remarkable three-point uh, three shooters in this league, remarkable. And I think because of the three-point line, a lot of people today are, um, you know, they'll shoot 35 or even 40 uh, threes. I don't like it myself. I don't think it gives you the best chance to win um, at all. But if you talk to analytical people, they say yes. But I think there are certain times in the game where if a guy makes one or two, he might come down and miss. He might miss three in a row and the team scores. Teams come down, and make two threes and a layup and you they're ahead. Uh, I just wish that with the players who can really make it should shoot it. Uh, but I think we're going to see a different class of shooters going forward because of Steph Curry and because of the three-point line and also the emphasis that coaches have put on it today. They want everyone to shoot it. I don't see anyone that maybe plays a little bit more controlled game that's become a staple of the league and it's going to be here forever. Hmm. I've always wondered about this and you're the guy to ask because you were an 81% successful free throw shooter. The night that Will Chamberlain scored 100 points in a game in Hershey, Pennsylvania, he had 32 free throw attempts. I know how many he made. He made 28. I was going to tell you, I know how many he made. He made 28. He got, he got farther <laughs> along in his career. He was lucky to get to 50%. <laughs> what, did, what did you see in him for his free throw shooting? You know, I was really... Uh, he didn't have the kind of rhythm that you need. And Ross, early in my career, I would, I was a much better shooter from the field than from the free throw line. I, I, I don't know why I couldn't, but my career average went higher as I got along in my career and I probably paying a little bit more attention, but I'll never forget you bringing up this game that he scored a hundred points. We had gotten into St. Louis and we had been talking in the flight to St. Louis. We're going to play the Hawks there, which are now the Atlanta Hawks. We were talking about he's going to score 100 points some night in a game huh. because he was so dominant and he was shooting the ball, you know, a lot in the game. And everyone said, well, if he could ever make free throws, he'd get there. 
we get off the plane, we get to the hotel, and one of the butlers there at the door said, Did you hear what Wilt did tonight? No one said, No, he scored 100 points. We had been talking about it all day long. Oh. So, all day long, because he had wow. put some incredible numbers up there. And um, um, the only other person, I think Kobe Bryant, the 98th what was scored 81. 81, yeah. I think that if Phil Jackson left him in there the way he was going, that might, it might have happened. And that would have been a true miracle for someone his size to do that. He would have gotten close, I think. He could have drop kicked it and have gone in the basket that night. <laughs> Did Wilt ever ask you to help him with his free throw shooting? No. <laughs> it looked like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it got to the point. It got to the point where he'd try everything. He'd get back almost to the top of the circle. <laughs> you know, in college, you know, he could dunk the ball from the oh. free throw line in college. They changed the rule in college that you couldn't jump over the free throw line until the ball, uh, until the ball hit the basket. But he was a remarkable athlete. Some of the things he did in Kansas, throwing the shot, running the 440, high jumping. Uh, he did some amazing things when he was in college. So he was a, he was a real athlete himself. Jerry, you had a great vertical jump. I think they said that you could go 16 inches above the rim, which of course had to help you to get 13 rebounds a game uh, in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was a talent. A lot of people don't might realize that. Well, as I say, Loss, I have a 40 inch length and I'm like, I'm like someone 6'9". I measure like someone 6'9 who reaches. Uh, I had a 38 inch vertical uh, when I came into the league. And really I attribute that to, we never had a car. I ran everywhere. I didn't walk, I ran. Mm. And climbing the mountains all the time. And I used to run all the time. And it was like, I used to laugh at it and I have like Forrest Gump. <laughs> run, run, Jerry, run. But uh, I'm sure that a lot of that contributed to it, loss. I don't know. And genetics are a strange thing, okay? Some people, uh, some people are, not blessed with fast switch muscles. I was fast switch muscles certainly give you an advantage if you're an athlete. Is it unfair for me to ask you who the best player was you've ever seen? Me, um, me is still Michael Jordan, but there are players that are close and have been close. I think because I'll say this because he was the best defensive player in the league, Ross. He was the best defensive player, period. But he was also the greatest offensive player. And he, um, a great player uh, like him, like others, they, they can beat you by themselves. And when the game was on the line, you know, forget it. If he's going to shoot it, he was going to make it. Uh, but to, to me, um, and obviously, uh, I really respect him personally. Ross, he has never changed. I mean, he's the same person today. I've always had a great relationship with him. Uh, obviously, you, you know, you hear other players, uh, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant. Um, for me, Abdul-Jabbar is forgotten by far. Um, and there's a lot of players. That, and again, I don't want to offend anyone because I'm sitting here trying to think of them during this, but yeah, there's a lot true. of other really, really great players that played out there. But I still think Michael Jordan the most explosive athlete I've ever seen, period. Mm. Mm. And his will to compete was, I think, far above others. Mm. Jerry, I can't tell you how much this has meant to me to be able to share these stories and experiences you had and what a credit you have been, not only to the game of basketball, but as you expressed so beautifully early, what you feel about people and charities and so on. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I thank you for the time that you gave me today. Thank you, Ross. Always great to visit with you, and wish you well going forward. Take care. Bye.